fighting the financial crisis. What can Europe's bank do? In the interview, the president of the European Investment Bank, Werner Hoyer. Dr. Hoyer, you're president of the European Investment Bank. What does it actually do? The European Investment Bank was founded 55 years ago to provide long-term financing for investment projects for the member states of the then emerging European Economic Community. Since then, the 28 members of the European Union have become the bank's owners. It's by far the biggest multilateral bank in the world, both in terms of funding and raising capital. We get that capital from the markets, 72 to 75 billion a year. On the lending side, last year we had a volume of well over 70 billion euros for financing projects inside and outside the European Union. In very general terms, the bank finances four major sectors. Things have changed a lot since the early days. Much of our work remains in infrastructure, but today infrastructure is more than building roads and railways. It's communications technology, broadband cable and the like, or land-based grids for supplying energy. And in the context of Germany's current transition to green energy, that's a very important factor. That means you raise money on capital markets to make Europe more eco-friendly. Ultimately, yes. We are the ones who finance corporate projects to make Europe more eco-friendly and climate neutral. EU climate goals are very ambitious. They serve as the guidelines for our activities in this sector. The third sector we're active in is one that no one would have thought about when the bank was founded. That's small and mid-sized companies. Back then, everyone said that was a job for private private banks or other lenders. But as capital markets have developed along with bank regulation, it's become progressively harder on these firms. These days, your average small business person has problems getting a bank loan, and equity financing, which is an everyday matter in the US, isn't as widespread in Europe. That's why in 2012 we provided nearly 22 billion euros in financing for small and mid-sized enterprises, and reached a total of 32,000 companies in the process. And the fourth sector, which is especially especially close to my heart, and will be this bank's sector of the future, is innovation. Europe is currently far behind in financing innovation. It starts with education, where we invest far too little, and spans scientific research and technology all the way to turning research results into products and production processes. A lot of that will be heading our way in the coming years. Currently, it's about 17 billion euros. On the subject of innovation, where's Europe now in comparison to Japan or the US? Europe has lagged behind in investment long before the financial crisis hit in 2007. Today, seven years after the crisis, we are 15 percent below our investment volume of 2007. Additionally, over the past 10 years, we've also fallen far behind in financing innovation. Europe currently invests about 1.9 percent of its GDP for what can be called innovation in the broadest sense. In Japan, that figure is well over 3 percent, in Korea, 3.4 percent, and the Americans are over 3 percent too. In one, two or three years, that doesn't make much difference. But when it remains unchanged for a decade or more, it's no wonder that one is no longer the market leader in certain technologies and has left that role to others. And that's already the case in many areas. Why does Europe spend too little on innovation? I think that awareness of the whole issue of education, investment in the future, in research, and especially in translating research into products and processes, is something that's still too feeble among Europeans. We should be willing to pay extra for it, because someday we'd be rewarded handsomely. What part did your bank play in overcoming the debt crisis in Europe? I call the European Investment Bank the last undiscovered treasure of the European integration process. No one's heard about it. It's almost unknown. It's located in the forests of Luxembourg that have grown quietly for decades. Today, without most politicians knowing it, it's two and a half times the size of the World Bank. That means in its volume alone, it has enormous potential to assist in a crisis. 
Second, the European Council has also commissioned us to redouble our activity, including our investments, during difficult times. During the crisis years, we substantially expanded our business volume, and three years ago, when banks started consolidating to attain their target capital balance sheets and volume was supposed to be cut, the European Council decided to grant us a capital increase so that we could raise more money on capital markets. I think that European financial reform is important, essential in fact, there's no doubt about that. Still, we should also be expanding investment at the same time. In that respect, and in all humility, I think the bank has played an essential role. What part has your bank played in overcoming the debt crisis in Greece? Essentially, every major international bank has abandoned Greece. In the end, we're almost the only one left, and during the hard times we helped Greece, supported the Greek people. And that means that our exposure today equals 9% of Greek GDP in outstanding sums. I think we've achieved a good mix. We financed small and mid-sized firms that otherwise wouldn't have had a chance of getting a normal bank loan. As far as energy projects, we've done a lot in Greece, and we've got the infrastructure projects running again. During the crisis, those went dormant and were cancelled outright. Those are big projects in Greece that are both improving the country's infrastructure and immediately putting people to work. Is Greece over the worst? Greece is on the right path. Developments in the past few weeks and months have been positive. The country is still far too deeply in debt, and therefore the Greek government must keep setting very ambitious goals. And I must say, I deeply respect the great challenges the Greek government has shouldered. I don't know whether the huge sacrifices that the Greek people have made would have been possible in Germany or other northern European countries. That's why we should really give the Greeks the chance to bring this process to a successful conclusion. Would you say Europe is over the worst of the debt crisis? Yes, the direction we've set, the political decisions to push recovery have been made, especially because the construction defects in the Maastricht Treaty have now been fixed the hard way. I believe the latest decisions on fiscal union and banking union have closed these gaps. Therefore, given the solidity in the construction of the European House, the European Union is in much better shape now than only a few years ago. I must add, however, that we want to be sure the light at the end of the tunnel isn't from a train coming in our direction. That means we have to wait for these undeniable successes to translate into more growth and employment. There's life after the crisis, as they say, but today's crisis is called Ukraine. Is your bank involved here too? We are very strongly committed in Ukraine thanks to Europe's neighbourhood policy. We currently have a volume of more than 2 billion euros committed there. And our project pipeline for the next three years will add another 1.5 billion to that. What are you financing there? We are financing infrastructure as well as the energy sector and energy efficiency and small and mid-sized companies. After the European Council asked us to examine what we could do in Ukraine, we combed through our project pipeline and said, OK, by moving projects forward, we could bring it up to 3 billion over three years. That's hugely ambitious because we don't give any money for budget financing or any kind of liquidity help. Every cent that the European Investment Bank pays to a member state or partner country has to finance projects. These projects have to be financeable. The International Monetary Fund, having been burned again and again in Ukraine, then pulled out saying we can't do much here. Why do you think you'll be more successful? Because we finance projects, and that's the real economy. We don't finance any slippery deals in the purely illusionary financial world. We finance real projects and one can calculate whether they make sense or not. 
The job of the IMF is much tougher, I must add. You are a seasoned foreign policy professional. What advice would you offer the Ukrainian government? Good advice is rare there. I have to say, the government in Kiev faces an enormous task, and it must ultimately win the trust of a majority of the population. Can a Ukrainian economy function without the Russian market? Everything that was and is produced in Ukraine has ultimately been for Russia. That's why Russia would have to be brought on board. But on the other hand, many Ukrainians and Westerners see Russia as a destabilizing factor, a difficult situation for Kiev. Following 1989 and even beforehand, both Western leaders and former Soviet President Gorbachev agreed that peace and stability in Europe can only be achieved with Russia and not organized against Russia. That's being tested now. Russia has certainly committed a gross violation of international law. We can only hope it will not keep going down that path, but return to cooperation in confidence. Or at least return to a level where confidence building is again possible. A huge amount has been lost in a short amount of time. It would be best, I believe, to analyze interests. And everybody's interests, when you analyze them closely would benefit if someone said sit down, negotiate, make good contracts and organize your coexistence constructively. That's also the way Ukraine would fare best, of course. Thank you for the interview. Thank you.